Greetings. I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Given the current situation, it really wasn't practical. But this too will pass with time, and it's time I want to talk about today. There is perhaps no writer of the early days of Christianity who had a higher understanding of the human being than Irenaeus of Lyon. Although he's best known for his statement that the glory of God is a living human being, it is in fact his reflections on time and growth that are perhaps the most profound. His way of understanding the arc of the economy from Adam to Christ, in terms of a movement from infancy to maturity, have, I would suggest, yet to be really explored and have much to offer. The temporality of creation is not something accidental for Irenaeus. Indeed, in the opening book of his Against the Heresies, he specifies that one of the tasks of the theologian is to, as he puts it, set forth why it is that one and the same God made some things temporal and others eternal. And again, in giving a short statement of the rule of faith a little, a few chapters later on, expanding on the clause that the Father made all things through the Word, he adds, whether visible or invisible, whether sensible or intelligible, whether temporal for the sake of an economy or eternal. So time is not accidental. It's not the result of some kind of fall. It has a purpose. It is for the sake of a certain economy. Now there are three passages that I would like to look at where Irenaeus reflects further on the significance of temporality. All of them have to be from the fourth book of Against the Heresies. The first, in chapter 11, inscribes this temporality and therefore mutability into the very nature of the relationship between God and his handiwork, based as this is on the logic of creation. That is, that it is God who skillfully fashions a human being, while the human being is made by God. So he says here, For he formed him for growth and increase, as the scripture says, increase and grow. And indeed, in this respect, God differs from the human, that God indeed makes, but the human is made. And he who is made is always, sorry, and he who makes is always the same, while he who is made must receive a beginning, a middle, addition, and increase. And God indeed makes well, while the human is well made. So whereas today we might read the two words, increase and multiply, as synonyms, both referring to procreation, Irenaeus takes the word increase as grow, grow up, which is in fact the meaning of the Greek word avxanisthe. Having come into existence, Adam and Eve are, as he puts it several times, but infants. They need to grow before they can multiply. Further, as having been made, the human being must have a beginning, the starting point for their growth. So Irenaeus continues in the passage by saying that while God is perfect in all things, equal to himself, similar to himself, the human being receives advance and growth towards God. As God is always the same, he says, so the human being, when found in God, shall always go on towards God. There is no end in the sequence he sketches. Beginning, middle, addition, increase. There's no end that he specifies. Likewise, God never ceases from bestowing gifts upon the human being, nor does a human being ever cease from receiving these benefits and being enriched. It is for each human being to determine how they will respond, whether thankfully or ungratefully, and everything depends upon this response. So time is the prerequisite for growth, and it's by growth that a creature changes their mode of existence while remaining what they are by nature. When I was a child, I thought as a child, as the Apostle Paul says, but now I've become an adult, I've put away childish things. That only things subject to time can grow, change their mode of life, is of fundamental importance for Irenaeus, as we will see. <clears throat> the second passage I'd like to consider is in chapter 4 to 5 of book 4. Here Irenaeus provides a further analysis of the rationale of the temporality of the fashioning of the handiwork by God in the economy. 
In this section devoted to temporality and transience, Arrhenaeus points out that all things created in time necessarily have an end in time, and so the passing away of things in the world is a natural occurrence. They are brought into existence in time for a particular purpose, or to produce a certain fruit, and when that purpose of fruit arrives, it brings an end to that which produced it. So, he says, vine twigs exist for the sake of the grapes they produce. And so to Jerusalem, having begun with David, fulfilled in its own time and came to an end when the new covenant was revealed. And so he concludes using the words of Paul from 1 Corinthians, the fashion of the whole world must also pass away when the time of its disappearance has come, so that the fruit may be gathered into the granary and the chaff be consumed by fire. Now the human being, he says, belongs to this transient world of coming into being and passing away, but also differs in two fundamental respects. First, unlike the wheat and the chaff, where the one who creates them is also the one who separates them, human beings are endowed with reason and free will, and so are themselves a cause of becoming either wheat or chaff. And second, he asserts that the world was created to enable the growth of the human being into the immortality of God. And so he concludes his reflections in, about temporality in chapter 4 to 5 by saying, God therefore is one and the same, who rolls up the heaven like a book, and renews the face of the earth, who made the temporal things for the human, so that, maturing in them, they may bear as fruit immortality, and who through the, his kindness also confers eternal things, so that in the ages to come he may show the exceeding riches of his grace. So the temporality and mutability of creation and the human being within creation are therefore for Irenaeus provided by God as a context in which a human being can learn to grow into the immortality of God. And as it's a pre present fashion of the world that passes away, not the substance, the fashion, so in turn, when the human being comes to participate in the immortality of God, God will transfigure the initial fashion of the body of humiliation to conform it to the body of his glory, as Paul puts it in Philippians and 1 Corinthians. In the very last paragraphs of Book 5 of Against Heresies, Irenaeus refers back to this discussion in Book 4 to further clarify what is meant by the fashion of the world passing away. And the mention that we have in Isaiah and the Apocalypse of John about a new heaven and a new earth. The fashion of the world, he says, that passes away refers to, in his words, that in which the transgression occurred, for the human being has grown old in them. While neither the nature nor the substance is destroyed, for firm and true is he who established it. And he carries on. When the human being shall be renewed and flourishing in, in, in an incorruptible state, it is no longer able to grow old. In this new heaven and earth, the new human being will remain holding converse with God in an always new manner. And then with death, the last enemy being destroyed, the son will yield up his work to the father that he might be all in all. The third passage I'd like to look at is Book 4, chapters 37 to 39. It's here that he gives his most extensive reflection on the process of growth and maturation within the temporal span of a human lifetime. In these chapters, Irenaeus begins by expounding what he calls the ancient law of human liberty. The fact that, as he puts it, God has created the human being free, having from the beginning power over himself. As we've seen, only creatures created with freedom are capable of initiative and response, and only in this way are they capable of changing the mode or fashion of their existence and growing into the immortality of God. After citing many passages from Scripture to demonstrate human freedom, a freedom which extends, for Irenaeus, even to faith, and the corresponding responsibility and accountability that follows on from this, Irenaeus turns to those who would deny this, representing, he says, the Lord as destitute of power, unable to accomplish what he willed, or as ignorant that some human beings are merely material and not able to receive immortality, 
His opponents are the Gnostics. For them, some people, as he says, are merely material. They will never be, receive immortality. Then he draws out the presuppositions of his opponent's position, their question. Their question, he says, is, but, they say, he should not have created angels in such a way that they were able to transgress, nor human beings such that they immediately became ungrateful towards him, because they are created rational and capable of examining and judging, and not like irrational or inanimate creatures which are not able to do anything of their own will, but are drawn by necessity and force towards the good, with one inclination and one bearing, unable to deviate and without the power of judging, and unable to be anything other than what they were created. Had this been the case, Irenaeus replies, it wouldn't have benefited neither God nor human beings. Communion with God would not be precious, desired, or even sought after. It would be by nature, and not as a result of their own proper endeavour, care, or study. It would be misunderstood, and no pleasure would be found in it. He then continues by quoting Christ's words that the violent take it by force and Paul's exhortation to us to run the race, emphasising the need for struggle on the grounds that the endeavour heightens the appreciation of a gift. He says, as it lies with us to love God the more, the Lord has taught and the apostle has handed down this, that this will happen with struggle. For not otherwise, this, our good, would be unknown, not being the result of striving. Aeneas gives an example by way of explanation. He points out that the faculty of seeing is desired more by those who know what it is like to be without sight, and so also health is prized more by those who know disease, light by contrast with darkness, and life by contrast with death. Elsewhere in Book 3, he gives the example of Jonah to describe how the whole economy from beginning to end has been arranged in such a manner that human beings come to know their own weakness in their death, for it is here that they simultaneously know the power of God made perfect in strength. And having known the experience of death, they might thereafter hold ever more firmly to the source of life. Going back to Book 4. In chapter 39, Irenaeus develops this analysis by contrasting two different kinds of knowledge. There is on the one hand the knowledge gained through experience, and on the other hand the knowledge learned through hearsay. And he points out that it's only through experience that the tongue comes to learn of both bitter, bitterness and sweetness, by tasting honey for instance. And likewise it's only through the experience of both good and evil the latter being disobedience and death, that we receive the knowledge of the good, that is obedience to God, which is life for human beings. We can hear the words that life is a gift, but we don't really believe it until we experience, not just in our heads but in our guts, what it's like to be without life. And then having that experiential knowledge, we will thereafter ever more firmly hold on to the source of life and receive it as a gift. By experiencing both and casting off disobedience through repentance, the human being, as in the case of Jonah, becomes ever more tenacious in obedience to God, growing into the fullness of life. And the alternative to this, Irenaeus says really dramatically, he says, if anyone shuns the knowledge of both of these and the twofold perception of knowledge, forgetting himself he destroys the human being. That's from chapter 39. Returning back to chapter 37, where we were. Irenaeus continues that therefore the heavenly kingdom would be more precious to those who've known the earthly kingdom. And if they prize it the more, they will also love it the more. And loving it the more, they'll be glorified more by God. He then concludes this section in chapter 37. He says, God therefore has borne all of these things for our sake, in order that, having been instructed through all things, henceforth we may be scrupulous in all things, and having been taught how to love God in accordance with reason, we might remain in his love, God exhibiting patience in regard to the apostasy of human beings, and the human being being taught by it, 
as the apostle says, your own apostasy shall heal you. He then immediately continues by placing this action of God within the economy as a whole. So he says, God thus determining all things beforehand for the perfection of the human being and towards the realization and manifestation of his economies, that goodness may be displayed and righteousness accomplished and that the church may be conformed to the image of his son and that finally the human being may be brought to such maturity as to see and comprehend God. So human disobedience, apostasy and death is for Irenaeus inscribed into the very unfolding of the economy, which is always seen from the light of the crucified and risen Lord. Never before that. Death results from human action. Absolutely, God did not create death. But it's nevertheless a result which is subsumed and transformed within the larger arc of the economy, as it brings a creature made from mud to share in the very life, glory and power of the uncreated. So demonstrating the goodness and the righteousness of God. Worked out in and through the life of each individual human being, if they should respond with faith, faithfulness and thankfulness and gratitude, the conclusion is not individual but corporate. As he concludes here, finally the human, uh, it is the church that is conformed to the image of, of um, his son, as each human being is brought to see and comprehend God. The church, the corporate body, is conformed to the image of his son. Now at the heart of the section that I'm considering is chapter 38, and this requires careful exposition. Here he begins by analysing the question with which he began these chapters, but from a different angle. He now suggests that God could indeed have created the human being as perfect, or as a God from the beginning, because of course all things are possible to him. Yet as created, he points out, human beings are initially infantile, and therefore they are unaccustomed to and unexercised in perfect conduct. So just as a, new, as a mother could give solid food to a newborn in, infant, but it wouldn't do the infant any good, so also Irenaeus con continues, it was possible for God himself to have made the human being perfect from the first, but the human being could not have received this, being as yet an infant. What is needed is growth, a process of accustoming the human being to bear the life and glory of God. So he concludes the first paragraph of chapter 38. For this reason, our Lord in this last times, when he had recapitulated all things into himself, came to us, not as he might have come, but as we were capable of beholding him. He might easily have come to us in his immortal glory, but in that case we could never have endured the greatness of the glory. And therefore it was that he who is a perfect bread of the Father offered himself to us as milk, because we were as yet infants. He did this when he appeared to us as human, that we being nourished as it were from the breast of his flesh, and having but such a course of milk nourishment that we might become accustomed to eat and drink the word of God and may be able to contain in ourselves the bread of immortality, which is the spirit of the Father. He then continues in the next paragraph, 438.2, by expounding this feeding by milk through Paul's words to the Corinthians, where Paul explains that they were given milk rather than meat, because, as Irenaeus puts it, they were not yet capable of receiving meat, as the senses of their soul were still feeble and untrained in the practice of things pertaining to God. God, he says, had the power to grant perfection to the human being at the beginning, but as recently created, the human being could not have received it, or if he had received it, he would not have retained it. And then he concludes, It was for this reason that the Son of God, although he was perfect, passed through the state of infancy, in common with the rest of humankind, partaking of it thus not for his own benefit, but for the infantile stage of human existence. Remember that, I'm going to come back to it. In order that the human being might be able to receive him. There was nothing therefore impossible to or lacking in God that the human was, that the human was not an uncreated being. But this merely applies to him who was recently created, 
that is, the human being. And then in the next paragraph, Arrhenius finally lays out the full scope of his vision. By definition, of course, the created cannot be uncreated. But this isn't a restriction upon the omnipotence of God, for the omnipotence is demonstrated in the very way in which the created is, in fact, brought in time to share in the uncreated life of God, a change in the fashion of its existence or its mode of life, a change which requires preparation and training. And it's to this that the whole economy has been aiming and has been tending. This passage is long, but it's the most beautiful passage, I think, in Irenaeus and should be quoted in full. So he says, With God, power, wisdom and goodness are demonstrated simultaneously. Power and goodness in that he willingly created and made things previously not existing. Wisdom in having made those things that have come into being rhythmical and harmonious and elaborate. Which through the superabundance of his goodness receiving growth and continuing for a long period of time, may obtain the glory of the uncreated, of the God who ungrudgingly bestows good. By virtue of being created, they are not uncreated, but by virtue of continuing in being through a long course of ages, they shall receive the power of the uncreated, of the God who freely bestows upon them eternal existence. And thus in all things, God has a preeminence alone uncreated, the first of all, and the supply of existence of all, while all others remain under God's subjection. Subjection to God affects incorruptibility, and continuance in incorruptibility affects the glory of the uncreated. By this order, and such rhythms, that's where I got my title from, by this order, and such rhythms, and such a movement, the created and fashioned human becomes in the image and likeness of the uncreated God. The Father planning everything well and commanding, the Son executing and performing, the Spirit nourishing and increasing, and the human being making progress day by day and ascending towards perfection, that is, approaching the uncreated one. For the uncreated is perfect, and this is God. Now, it was necessary first for the human being to be created, and having been created to increase, and having increased to become an adult, and having become an adult to multiply, and having multiplied to become strong, and having been strengthened to be glorified, and being glorified to see his master. For God is he who is yet to be seen, and the vision of God produces incorruptibility, and incorruptibility renders one close to God. Now what's most striking about this passage, and really this is the heart of my presentation, What's most striking about this passage, describing the whole arc of the economy, the growth from Adam to Christ, is that it is patterned upon the life of each human being, the seven stages, as it were, of life. And in turn, this means that one can see the lifespan of each human being as recapitulating the whole arc of the economy from the infant Adam to the mature, perfect Christ. Moreover, this recapitulation calls to mind Ernest Haeckel's formulation that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that the life of an individual being recapitulates the lifespan of the whole tribe. Now that's been debunked, of course, as an account of a possible similarity of the embryonic development um, to evolutionary history, that the idea that in the womb the, the the fetus grows in the same way that the evolutionary history has grown, or of the human race has, has undergone. But the idea has been picked up by evolutionary anthropologists. Mary Lacron Foster, for instance, notes, as she puts it, both biological evolution and the stages of the child's cognitive development follow much the same progression of the evolutionary stages as that suggested in the archaeological record. So the same movement that we see in the life of a human being is what we see in the lifespan of the human race as a whole through the archaeological record and indeed in the movement from the infant Adam to the mature Christ. It's also possible that this pattern of seven stages explains more fully Irenaeus' words, which I mentioned earlier, about Christ becoming an infant for humanity in its infancy. Earlier in Against the Heresies, 
Irenaeus reports that the elders who were around the Apostle John handed down the tradition from the evangelist that Christ reached, in fact, the age of 40 to 50. He passed through every stage of human life, including old age, so as to sanctify each age, recapitulating all things in himself. Christ says, uh, Irene says, He came to save all through means of himself. All, I say, who through him are born again to God. Infants, children, boys, youths, old men. One would be birth, seven would be, would be death. Independently, Victor Rhinus of Patel has got the same kind of formulation when he says, Christ consummates his humanity in the number seven. Birth, infancy, boyhood, youth, young manhood, maturity and death. Such is the rhythm and the movement of human life, which recapitulates the movement of the economy. We can no more escape its pattern or anticipate its conclusion than we can expect a newborn infant to live in an adult manner. And so Irenaeus concludes his chapters by saying, Irrational, therefore, in every way, are those who await not the time of increase and ascribe instead to God the infirmity of their nature. He continues, Knowing neither God nor themselves, being un- insatiable and ungrateful, they are unwilling to be at the outset what they've been created, human beings subject to passion, wanting to be gods from the beginning, rather than at first human and only then gods, they blame God and show their ungratitude towards him for what is in fact given them, even though God has adopted this course, he says, out of his pure benevolence. Aeneas cites the two verses of Psalm 81 to demonstrate this point. I say you are God's son of the Most High, but since we couldn't sustain that, the psalmist adds, but you shall die like human beings. And then he concludes, this sets forth both truth. By his kindness he graciously gave good and made the human being self-governing like himself. But by his foreknowledge he knew the weakness of human beings and what would come of it. Yet by love and power he overcame the substance of our created nature. The economy works, he worked through the whole economy to bring us to be at the end what he designed us from the beginning. Finally, then, Aeneas concludes all the chapters we've been looking at by sketching out this economy of growth in a few brief strokes. It was necessary first for nature to be manifest, after which for what is mortal to be conquered and swallowed up by immortality and the corruptible by incorruptibility, and for human being to be made in the image and likeness of God, having received the knowledge of good and evil. Irenaeus takes the words of God in Genesis 3.22 Behold, the human being has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, as spoken without any sense of irony, but as a statement reflecting just how it is that the creature made from dust, coming to know both good and evil, and rejecting the latter through repentance, becomes in the end a human being in the image and likeness of growth a process which requires growth just as it does across the lifespan of each individual human being. The newborn baby cannot walk. It has to learn how to walk, which involves falling down, getting bruised and picking itself up again. Now, if one of the tasks that Irenaeus has set before the theologian is to reflect on why it is that God made some things eternal and others temporal, I think we can safely say that he's given us the answer. God cannot create an uncreated being, but he can create those who come to share in his life in, and so receive the power and the glory of the uncreated as Christ has shown us to be. But to do this requires growth, for the one newly coming, coming into existence is as yet unprepared to accept the fullness of the pattern of life that God gives, and this growth requires time. This pattern that Irenaeus sees in the scriptural arc that leads from the infant Adam to the mature Christ is, I suggest, clearly patterned upon or mirrors the lifespan of each human being and likely the lifespan of the human race as a whole. In all of this, then, God has, as Irenaeus puts it, 
harmonized the human race to the symphony of salvation. And then finally, Irenaeus says that one who is a true Christian will have a faith in one God, one Christ, and the Spirit of God, who has enacted in the human race, in each generation, the economies of the Father and the Son, according to the will of the Father. Now, the word I've translated as enacted, skinovatun, literally means to bring on stage, to perform. And so how else can I, sorry, and so how else can I conclude but with the words of the bard? All the worlds are stage, and all the men and women are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Although I suspect that Irenaeus would disagree with the word merely. This is indeed the very economy of God being worked out in space, in time, through the course of the whole economy, which is recapitulated in the pattern of growth for each human lifespan. Thank you.